gymnasium, the projectors are working, the sound's on, so if you need to exercise uh, uh, ch uh, children or you yourself are getting stiff and elderly and need to get up and walk around a little bit, I guess you can exercise that option as well. First section, honestly now. Today we're talking about Jesus' teachings and how that relates to the Bible in general. Most of us wish we knew our Bible better than we do. It's been called the book we dust and trust. You can even fool yourself into thinking you know it better than you actually do. Two lawyers were arguing on opposite sides of a case. During the trial, one thought he would make a great impression on the jury by quoting from the Bible. He said, concerning his opponent's client, we have it on the highest authority that all that a man has will he give for his skin. Well, the other lawyer knew the Bible better. He said, I'm very much impressed by the fact that my distinguished colleague here regards as the highest authority the one who said, all that a man has will he give for his skin. You will find that this saying comes from the book of Job and the one who utters it is the devil. And that is who he regards as the highest authority. Oops. The fifth saying in the way of Jesus is, I am learning the teachings of Jesus. Well, at first you might suppose we're just talking about the parts where Jesus is actually quoted. That would be the, the red letter portions in some Bibles, the ones that have the words of Jesus in red. But is it just those bits that originate with Jesus? Next section, Jesus is author of how much of the Bible? In the way of Jesus' handbook, Pastor Phil Delso wrote, the entire Bible comprises the teachings of Jesus. Jesus, during the days of his flesh, put his seal of approval on scripture as the very word of God. Jesus, as the eternal son of God, is just as much the author of scripture as is the father or the spirit, unquote. Hmm. How do you get from just the red letter bits to the whole Bible being Jesus' teachings? We read in John 1, 14 and 18, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the father's side has made him known. In this prologue or forward to John's gospel, Jesus is called the word, the logos, the, the making sense, making known. Jesus became flesh, was born as a human, son of man, but also son of God, in order to communicate God the Trinity to us, to make God know. When God is speaking, that involves Jesus. Hebrews 1 carries some of the same force. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets of many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. God is there. He is not silent. He has spoken through the prophets as recorded in scripture, but most clearly and definitively, he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus, who represents God's being exactly. Jesus' word is powerful. It's that word we hear coming through in the Bible. Now, some people try to drive a wedge between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Covenant or deal and the New Covenant or deal, but Jesus himself emphasized the continuity of the two. In his initial main message in Matthew's account, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Do you think from this that Jesus had a high view of scripture? At a critical point, when confronted by people ready to stone him, Jesus called upon the authority of scripture, quoting Psalm 82, verse 6, to underline his own identity. Now it says the Jews have the stones in their hands, they're ready to stone him. John 10, 35, 
Jesus says, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? Scripture is trustworthy, infallible. It cannot be broken, as Jesus says here. Jesus refers to it as the word of God. And if he is God's son, then it is also his word. The Bible is profoundly about Jesus. The Old Testament anticipates him. The New Testament welcomes and describes him and, and looks forward to his return. After Jesus' resurrection, he met a couple of despondent disciples on the road to Emmaus, but they were kept from recognizing him until they broke bread together. While they were walking along, Jesus treated them to an overview of scripture that highlighted how much it pointed to himself. Luke 24, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures, Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. There you have the heart of the Bible in a nutshell summarized by the author. God has entered and acted in history to save us from the fracture of relationship that our sin caused. So while Jesus is at the center of the story, it's also about us, our being drawn back into friendship with our creator. Pastor Phil writes in the Way of Jesus Handbook, the scriptures are the teachings of Jesus in the sense of the teachings about Jesus. He is the subject of the scriptures, the one promised by scripture. He is the author of scripture as the agent of creation, the logos, the, the word. During the days of his flesh, he endorsed the scriptures as the word of God and lived in obedience to them. The scriptures are in every way the teachings of Jesus. The logos was with God in the beginning. All things were created by and for Jesus, Paul states in Colossians 1. We need his timeless perspective to help us know what life is really all about. Recently, I've been struck by how short life is. A man younger than me who lived near the Anglican Church in Blythe died suddenly. Then another man, the same age as me, who was the father-in-law of one of my parishioners, didn't even make the proverbial three score years and ten, let alone four score. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, was also struck by life's brevity and his need for guidance from some eternal source. John Wesley said, I am a creature of a day, passing through life as an arrow through the air. I am a spirit coming from God and returning to God, just hovering over the great gulf. A few months hence, I am no more seen. I drop into an unchangeable eternity. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. God himself has condescended to teach the way. He hath written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. Next section. How do we know the Bible is reliable? Promises, promises. We're in the midst of a federal election campaign and leaders are rolling out promises and platforms and pledges of funding daily. The news reported one leader mocking another leader as not having to come up with new campaign promises. They just recycle the ones they failed to keep last time. And no, I'm not saying who. Political promises are legendary for not being very reliable. But is scripture like that? Are its promises only so much hot air? How do we know the Bible is authoritative and reliable, that it can be trusted? Through the public library, I borrowed and finished listening to Lee Strobel's excellent book, The Case for the Real Jesus. Strobel uses his journalistic skill to do an excellent job of researching whether criticisms of Christian doctrine hold any water. He does a convincing job of reviewing the overwhelming manuscript evidence that the Bible we read today is a trustworthy translation of exactly what the authors were trying to say. 
New Testament manuscripts are so early and so abundant that no essential doctrine of Christian faith is in question due to the slight variances that may be introduced during the copying and transmission process. Also, criteria such as enemy attestation and the criterion of embarrassment give us confidence that what the original authors wrote was actually historical, that the resurrection really happened, and so on. So you can borrow that from the public library, Lee Strobel, The Case for the Real Jesus. Excellent book. What does the Bible say about itself? At the risk of being accused of circular reasoning, what is Scripture's view of Scripture? Well, probably the most straightforward verses are 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture, not just parts of it, like Thomas Jefferson going through and cutting out this all the supernatural bits he didn't like. It's divinely inspired, God breathed. Jesus is the author, as we said. It's profitable, helpful for teaching, getting to know what's right, rebuking and correcting, getting us back on track when we go off the rails. It trains us in righteousness, the formation of godly, upright character, so that we as disciples become outfitted, equipped for every good work. So the aim of scripture is not just head knowledge, but shaping us for action, so we glorify God by our behavior and our achievements. Second Peter 1 also describes the inspiration process. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The writers spoke from God. They wrote what God wanted to convey, nudging them along as wind pushes a sailboat. It didn't originate in a person's will. It wasn't made up. As Peter said just a few verses earlier in 2 Peter 1.16, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were right there on the spot. Christianity is different from other major world religions, such as Buddhism or Hinduism, which are largely philosophical. Christianity is based on historical events and would have fallen apart from the first if evidence against the resurrection had been presented by Jesus' many enemies. But instead, the apostles and hundreds of others maintained to the point of death that they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. People don't die for what they know to be a lie. Other passages extol the excellence of Scripture, God's revelation to people. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. In the midst of the Enlightenment, when deism was spreading rapidly, Voltaire proclaimed that within 25 years, the Bible would be forgotten and Christianity would be a thing of the past. Forty years after his death in 1778, the Bible and other Christian literature were being printed in what had once been Voltaire's very own home. Psalm 19 describes more qualities of what God has revealed in Scripture. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold and much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. Is God's word precious to us? Do we view it as trustworthy, sure, perfect? Does it give our heart joy as we read it? Now, a skeptic might object that it's circular reasoning to quote scripture to prove the authority of scripture. But if something is authoritative, 
you run into a problem if you start using something else outside that to attempt to prove it's authoritative because whatever you're referring to would have to be more authoritative than scripture itself. So another approach is to say that scripture is self-authenticating. That is, that it proves itself to us as we read it. Of course, because the Holy Spirit is witnessing inside us to its truthfulness because it is God-breathed. In our scripture passage read earlier from John 6, Jesus attested to the quality of what he was speaking. Uh, John 6, 63, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. When Jesus asked his disciples if they were going to leave like some of the others were doing, Peter responded adamantly. In verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The truth of what Jesus taught was resonating already inside Peter. As for this self-authenticating aspect, I ran across something similar in my quiet time recently when I was reading Paul's second letter of the church, Corinth, 2 Corinthians 4.2. Paul says, rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Think about that. As the truth is set forth plainly, the apostles preaching and writing, it is commended to each person's conscience. As you hear it, your own conscience affirms the truthfulness of it. Next section, the proof is in the putting into practice. As we read it and absorb it and apply it, it proves its own value. Scripture is God breathed for a purpose, to be useful for teaching, training in righteousness, forming Christ-like character within us, imprinting us with the Holy Spirit's truth and patterns so that we become equipped for every good work. Don't be thinking about the Bible as if it's a book of rules, like the driver's handbook or your grandmother's cheesecake recipe. Think of it more as a love letter, something intended to draw you closer into a relationship. Your best friend is sharing something very special with you. The Pharisees were experts on the Old Testament as a rule book. They had all the commands classified, broken down into 613 different snippets they could check off. But Jesus rebuked them for missing the main point. The way of Jesus' handbook observes, walking with God is about a relationship. Walking humbly is about recognizing his leadership, his lordship. Our identity is anchored in him and we experience the power of his transforming friendship. We grow in our love for him because we're coming to know him better. And we grow in our love for others because we see this is how he loves them and we want to be like him. So the upshot of a Bible reading is not about doing so much as about being becoming more like Jesus. What is the heart of Jesus' teachings? Well, we've been talking about the entire Bible as being Jesus' teachings, but it's not a bad idea to start with the red letter bits and work out from there. Jesus is Lord of Scripture, so we interpret the parts that are harder to understand or present problems in the light of God's supreme revelation in Jesus. Well, what was most central to Jesus' message? What is the greatest commandment? Come on. Of God and love others. Go back and review last week's sermon. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what did Jesus say was my command? Love one another as he has loved us. That's the very heart of his teaching, for sure. Use that when you encounter Bible passages that are more difficult to understand. If you make a list of Jesus' parables, you'll come up with a list about 25 in Matthew and 14 in Luke. The ones in Mark are pretty much also included in Matthew. Is there a dominant theme that stands out in these creative stories Jesus used as illustrations when preaching to crowds? Well, about 11 or nearly half have something to do with the kingdom of heaven. He'd often begin a parable by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like weeds growing amongst wheat. 
A mustard seed sprouting and growing huge, yeast leavening a whole loaf, a treasure hidden in a field, a pearl of great value, a dragnet catching all kinds of fish, a servant that was shown mercy but didn't do that in turn, laborers in a vineyard, hired late but paid for a full day, a great banquet where none of the original guests wanted to come so others benefited instead. So the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of God in Luke's terms, is a central theme in Jesus' teaching. In fact, how did he begin his ministry at the very outset in Mark 1.15? The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus sees God's kingdom as not only coming eventually in history at his return, God's kingdom happens wherever God is ruling here and now. Where Jesus is through his spirit, there is the king. Jesus invites us to be walking in step with him each day of our lives, bringing the kingdom wherever we are in the power of his spirit. As you read John's gospel, what stands out there are not so much Jesus' parables as his seven I am statements. I'm the bread of life. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the light of the world. I'm the resurrection and the life and so on. Who is Jesus becoming to you? Are you letting him be your vine? As you read Mark's account, Jesus is portrayed as a man of action, immediately doing something else wonderful. Then you hit chapters 8, 9, and 10, and each chapter has a prediction of the coming crucifixion, a misunderstanding by the disciples, and a clarification by Jesus with a call to follow him to the cross as disciples. He's not just the wonder-working son of God, he is the suffering son of man. Come alongside us to share our sorrows and lead us to new life. Next section, the book that reads us. C.H. Spurgeon said, A Bible which is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. God did not give us the Bible so it could adorn our living room like some divine paperweight. The secret is to start reading it through the lens of Jesus. Find a version you can understand. Start with Mark or John and work forwards into the apostles' letters and gradually backward into the Old Testament once you know where things are headed. A good study Bible with notes at the bottom and book introductions can be a huge help. If you use a Bible app on your device, such as Uversion, there are beginner plans and more advanced plans according to what time you have available. Personally, I like the one-year Bible plan because it has a nice variety, but that takes about 20 minutes a day. However, if you use the audio feature, you can also listen to it while doing another activity, like I did this morning, taking out the horse and the goats and etc., etc. Just start somewhere and keep at it. I would say there are about five different stages in daily Bible reading. First is marvel. When you first become a Christian, it's all new. The Holy Spirit is highlighting exciting things. It's very revelatory. You're discovering. Then must. After you've been a Christian a few years, the Bible becomes more familiar. It's not new and as exciting, perhaps. There seem to be a lot of rules. It's becoming understood, and you may have some questions or doubts about some parts. Next, mimic. As you keep on, it's not just familiar, it's becoming internalized. It starts to shape you. The Bible is becoming replicated in you. It's being applied. Then mentoring. By this stage, after some years, Scripture is starting to seem like an old friend. As you read, you're also worshiping. The problem passages no longer cause you to trip or pause. Each day you anticipate getting topped up. It's relational. You're listening for the voice of God. What is it you want to show me today, Lord? And last, moot. That's the final stage. Well, if something is moot, as in moot point, according to the dictionary, it is having little or no practical relevance. Huh? When does this stage occur? Well, when you're dead. Scripture becomes moot when you're in heaven because you're now seeing and adoring the author face to face. It has become realized. He has delivered on all those promises. 
and uh, as the word puts it, we are being transformed into his likeness, and we shall see him as he is. We will be like him. Until then, it is the book that reads us. So keep on reading. Some seem to expect the word of God to hit them like a jolt of adrenaline each time they read or study it. Although the jolt may hit us periodically, the benefits of the word of God act more like vitamins. People who regularly take vitamins do so because of their long-term benefits, not because every time they swallow one of the pills they feel new strength surging through their bodies. I don't, unless you're like, not like me. They have developed a habit of consistently taking vitamins because they have been told that in the long haul, vitamin supplements are going to have a beneficial effect on their physical health, resistance to disease, and general well-being. The same is true of reading the Bible. At times, it will have a sudden and intense impact on us. However, the real value lies in the cumulative effects that long-term exposure to God's word will bring to our lives. Four pastors were discussing the pros and cons of various Bible translations and paraphrases. Eventually, each stated which version, in his opinion, is the best. Well, the first pastor said he used the King James because the old English style is beautiful and produces the most reverent picture of the, old, of the Holy Scriptures. The second said he preferred the New American Standard Bible because he felt it comes nearer to the original Greek and Hebrew texts. The third pastor said his favorite was the paraphrased Living Bible because his congregation was young and it related to them in a practical way. All three men waited while the fourth pastor sat silently. Finally, he said, I guess when it comes to translations and paraphrased editions of the Bible, I like my dad's translation best. He put the word of God into practice every day. It was the most convincing translation I've ever seen. You are the only translation of the Bible some people will ever read. Will you be stocked up on God's word such that what flows out of you is what God would be wanting to express of himself to them. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your excellent word. We praise you, Jesus, light of the world, for shining your truth into our lives, making yourself known, enveloping us in your love, sending your spirit into our lives so your kingdom becomes real in our situation. Grant us an insatiable appetite to get to know you better through your word. Let it not just stick in our head, but filter down into our heart, our character, 